we are ranking the 10 forgotten giants that outmuscled the legendary big boy. Monsters built to pull more, push harder, and shatter every engineering rule. From triple sets of drive wheels that threatened to rip up the tracks, to experimental locomotives that swapped steam for jet fuel. These machines redefined raw railroad power. Some were strong but flawed experiments, others conquered real-world extremes, and a few unleashed technology from the future and beyond. But which Iron Beast proved the strongest of them all? Let us begin at number 10 with the all-muscle, no-lungs machine that set the bar for impossible strength. The Erie P1 Triplex was born from raw ambition, a locomotive with 24 driving wheels and a headline tractive effort of 160,000 pounds. On paper, it was the strongest engine ever unleashed on American rails. Three hulking sets of drive wheels, all chained to a single boiler, promised to move mountains. But the triplex was a classic case of raw power without the breathing to sustain it. The boiler simply could not keep up. Every time the engineer opened the throttle, the six massive cylinders drained the steam faster than the firebox could produce it. Pressure would collapse, leaving the triplex gasping and stalled on the grade. The power was so intense it threatened to tear tracks apart and snap couplers on the cars behind. Freight crews quickly learned that the triplex could pull almost anything, just not very far and not very fast. Instead of conquering the main line, all three triplexes were relegated to helper duty, shoving trains up steep hills at a crawl. By 1933, everyone was scrapped. The legend of the triplex endures as a warning. Brute force means nothing if you cannot breathe. The Virginian XA triplex pushed the limits of brute strength even further. Built in 1916, this one-off monster was designed to outmuscle anything on the rails, boasting a reported tractive effort as high as 199,560 pounds in simple mode. The numbers looked unbeatable. But there was a catch, the XA could barely crawl. Under load, it managed just 5 miles per hour. That's not a typo. 5. The engine was so powerful it could rip a train loose from the earth, but only at a pace that made snails look reckless. The XA's job was to shove coal trains up the steepest grades in Virginia, but its glacial speed turned every haul into an all-day affair. Crews joked that you could walk alongside and still have time to light a cigarette before it reached the next milepost. The XA was rebuilt twice in a desperate bid to make it useful, first into a 288 Nero, then a 2882, but nothing could fix the speed problem. By the 1950s, the XA was gone, scrapped and forgotten. Raw force without velocity is just wasted time, and on the railroad, time is everything. The Virginian AE Double Decapod was built for one purpose, to deliver unstoppable torque to the rails. Ten of these giants rolled out in 1918, each one a compound mallet with a 210-10 two-wheel arrangement and a pair of cylinders so wide they had to be tilted just to clear the tracks. No other locomotive in history ran with cylinders this massive, 48 inches across, each stroke gulping more steam than some entire engines. That record-breaking width paid off in brute force, with attractive effort rated at 147,200 pounds in compound mode and up to 176,600 pounds when running simple. On the steep grades of West Virginia, the AE could shove coal trains that would leave the big boy spinning its wheels, but there was a price for all that muscle. The enormous pistons demanded constant attention, and the machinery wore itself out faster than smaller engines. Crews called them both a marvel and a maintenance headache. Even so, the AE class lasted into the late 1940s, pushing heavy loads as helpers and on secondary freight runs. Their legacy is widest cylinders ever built, attractive effort that dwarfed most rivals, and a reputation for power that only a handful of machines could match. The AE was the last of the wild experiments. After this, the real workhorses took over. Winter on the Misabi Range is not for the faint of heart. Temperatures drop to 30 below zero, snow piles up on the rails, and iron ore waits for no one. In these brutal conditions, the Duluth, Misab, and Iron Range Yellowstone came into its own. Built by Baldwin between 1941 and 1943, these two 884 giants were designed for one mission, 
drag 18,000-ton ore trains out of the Minnesota mines and keep them moving through the worst weather nature could throw at them. Each Yellowstone delivered 140,093 pounds of tractive effort, more than the big boy, and spread that force across 16 driving wheels. But raw numbers only tell half the story. The Yellowstone's frame was overbuilt, its axle boxes reinforced to take the continuous pounding of heavy ore loads. Specialized gearing meant these engines could start a loaded train on icy rails and keep it rolling, mile after mile, without slipping. Maintenance logs from the 1940s and 1950s show a record of reliability that few locomotives could match, especially in sub-zero temperatures where oil thickened and lesser engines froze solid. 18 Yellowstones carried the Duluth, Misab, and Iron Range through the Iron Boom, proving their worth every winter. In the world of real work, strength is not just about force, it is about showing up day after day when everything else quits. The Great Northern R2 was never built to impress the crowds. Its profile was squat and unremarkable, a far cry from the streamlined giants that filled calendars and posters. But on the mountain grades of the Cascades and Rockies, this ugly duckling exerted massive drag power that left the big boy in the dust. American Locomotive Company delivered 26 R-Class locomotives to the Great Northern in 1929, and 16 of those were the R2 variant, a 2882 articulated workhorse with a staggering 162,475 pounds of tractive effort. That is more pull than the big boy ever managed and it was not just a number on a builder's plate. The R2 had eight driving axles that gripped the rails with relentless adhesion, making it the go-to engine for the steepest, slickest tracks in the Northwest. Helper records from the era show R2 locomotives shoving massive freight consists up the Cascade Tunnel and over Marias Pass, where snowdrifts and rain turned steel rails into ice rinks. Crews trusted the R2 to keep moving when lighter engines spun their wheels and the locomotive's conservative wheel diameter meant it could dig in and pull, even on grades that would stall flashier machines. From the late 1920s through the 1950s, R2 locomotives ran both as primary freight haulers and as helpers, proving their worth in the harshest conditions. They were not pretty, but they were unstoppable. In a world obsessed with looks and headlines, the R2 quietly did the heavy lifting, hiding its true strength behind a plain exterior. For mountain railroading, brute force and steady traction beat glamour every time. In the Appalachian coal fields, the Norfolk and Western Y6B earned a reputation as the true king of the mountains. Built in Roanoke from 1948 to 1952, these two 882 giants were the last great American steam locomotives designed from the ground up for brutal mountain service. 30 Y6Bs rolled out of the shops, each one engineered to move the heaviest coal drags over grades that humbled lesser engines. The base tractive effort stood at 152,206 pounds, already outmuscling the big boy. But the Y6B had a secret weapon, a booster engine tucked into the trailing truck. With the booster engaged, tractive effort surged to a staggering 170,000 pounds enough to wrench a loaded train up Blue Ridge grades without breaking a sweat. The booster only kicked in at low speeds, giving the Y6B the extra punch needed to start massive coal trains from a dead stop. Once moving, the booster would cut out, and the locomotive settled into its relentless climb, the firebox and superheater working in perfect harmony to keep steam pressure steady. Norfolk and Western crews trusted the Y6B to deliver, even on the steepest, slickest tracks of Virginia and West Virginia. Maintenance logs and crew rosters from the 1950s show Y6 beasts in daily service long after other roads had abandoned steam. Some ran well into the 1960s, defying the diesel tide by sheer force and reliability. The Y6B legacy is not just about numbers, it is about a machine that did exactly what it was built to do, day after day until the very end of the steam era. That is why the Y6B stands as the last and greatest of the working class heroes. The Chesapeake and Ohio H8 Allegheny was not just a heavy hauler, it was the definition of brute speed and relentless horsepower. With a 2666 wheel arrangement and a firebox bigger than some apartments, the Allegheny was built to do what the big boy could not, 
move massive freight loads fast. Lima Locomotive Works delivered 60 of these giants between 1941 and 1948, each tipping the scales at nearly 780,000 pounds, making them among the heaviest steam locomotives ever built. But the real headline was not weight, it was power. The Allegheny produced a verified 7,500 horsepower at the drawbar, nearly double what the big boy could manage. That kind of output was not just for show. On the Chesapeake and Ohio mountain mainlines, Alleghenies routinely hauled 5,000-ton coal trains at 45 miles per hour and could hit 60 miles per hour on a straightaway. This is where horsepower and tractive effort part ways. Tractive effort is the raw pulling force, how much weight an engine can budge from a standstill. Horsepower is how much work it can do over time, especially at speed. The big boy had the edge in tractive effort, but the Allegheny's higher boiler pressure, massive firebox, and three-axle trailing truck let it sustain more power at higher speeds. A 260 pounds per square inch boiler and four cylinders measuring 22.5 inches by 33 inches kept the steam coming mile after mile. In real service, that meant fewer helpers, faster schedules, and more tonnage moved in less time. The Allegheny was not just another giant, it was the high-speed heavyweight champ, and that is why it earns its place among the true horsepower kings. The Pennsylvania Railroad Q2 Duplex was a machine built for the record books, a 4464 wheel arrangement with two sets of driving wheels and an ambition to break every steam horsepower barrier in sight. On the dynamometer, the Q2 stunned even its designers, posting an indicated 8,000 horsepower. No other steam locomotive in North America came close, not even the Allegheny. The numbers were so high that Pennsylvania Railroad publicity men called it the test stand record holder, powerful but slippery. The secret was in the duplex drive. Instead of one set of big cylinders churning away, the Q2 split its power between two separate engines on a single rigid frame. Each set had its own pair of cylinders, four in total, all working together to deliver a smooth, continuous push. In theory, this design should have solved the age-old problem of hammer blow, the pounding force that shook rails and frames apart at speed. In practice, it created new headaches. The Q2's two engines did not always share the load evenly. One set might grip while the other spun, leading to sudden, unpredictable wheel slip. Pennsylvania Railroad crews called it the world's most powerful unicycle. The Q2's horsepower was real. Test reports from Altoona show the locomotive hitting 7,987 indicated horsepower at 57 miles per hour. But all that power was useless if it could not stick to the rails. Engineers tried everything, sanders, weight adjustments, even changes to the throttle linkage. Still, the Q2 had a reputation for slipping away half its potential every time it started a heavy train. Only 26 were built, and most saw less than a decade of service before being sidelined by diesels. The Q2 proved that raw numbers in the lab do not always translate to real-world dominance. Sometimes the biggest muscles just cannot find their footing. In 1954, Norfolk and Weston put its faith and a small fortune into a machine that barely resembled a locomotive at all. The John Henry looked nothing like the classic steam giants that came before. Its body was a slab-sided brick, stretching nearly 161 feet, with no elegant lines or exposed wheels. Underneath that industrial shell was a last-ditch gamble to keep steam alive in the diesel age. The John Henry was a steam turbine electric locomotive built by Baldwin and Westinghouse. Instead of pistons and rods, it used a water tube boiler to create high-pressure steam, which spun a turbine. That turbine powered a generator, and the electricity flowed to traction motors on each axle. The promise was smooth, endless torque, no pounding, no slipping, just steady pull from a machine that could, in theory, outlast any diesel. On paper, this was the future of steam. Fewer moving parts, less vibration, and the ability to deliver power at any speed. Norfolk and Weston's trial reports boasted about the John Henry's ability to start heavy coal trains with almost no wheel slip, thanks to the even push of its electric motors. But the real world had other ideas. The John Henry's boiler was fussy and slow to respond, making it hard to control power on the fly. 
The gearboxes and electric motors, untested in railroad service, broke down again and again. Maintenance crews, trained on pistons and valves, were baffled by the tangle of wires and reduction gears. The locomotive spent more time sidelined than moving freight. After less than five years, the experiment ended. The John Henry was scrapped in 1958, leaving behind only blueprints and a handful of photographs. It stands as a symbol of steam's last stand, a radical leap that landed just short of the future. Union Pacific wanted a machine that would make even the big boy look old-fashioned. In the 1950s, they unleashed a fleet of gas turbine electric locomotives called the Big Blow. It was a jet engine on wheels, the big boy killer. When the turbines fired up, the exhaust roared, sending shimmering heat waves down the track and leaving a trail of smoke for miles. Each unit packed up to 8,500 horsepower in its final form, and even the early models delivered 4,000 to 5,500 horsepower, more than enough to move the heaviest freight trains in the country. Instead of coal and water, the big blow burned Bunker C, a thick tar-like oil that was cheap and plentiful after World War II. These engines did not just break the speed limit for brute force, they broke all the rules. The turbines spun at thousands of revolutions per minute, driving a generator that fed electricity to traction motors on every axle. The result was a surge of power that dwarfed anything steam could manage. On the open plains, the big blow could pull a mile-long train at 70 miles per hour, its whistle drowned out by the howl of the turbine. Union Pacific ran up to 30 of these monsters across its main lines, betting the future of railroading on gas turbine technology. But there was a catch. Turbines are thirsty. At best, the big blow got three to five miles per gallon, guzzling fuel at a rate that made even diesel engines look efficient. The bunker sea oil had to be heated just to flow into the engine, and the turbines chewed through their own blades. Maintenance logs show constant repairs for blade erosion and fouled fuel lines. As fuel prices rose in the late 1960s, what once seemed like the future of railroading became a financial black hole. The big blows were retired by 1970, scrapped or left to rust in the desert. The big blow stands as the end game of locomotive power, a machine that could pull harder and move faster than the big boy, but at a cost no railroad could sustain. It was the last, loudest gasp of the horsepower race. In the end, even the most powerful giants fell to the quiet logic of economics. The big boy survived, but the jet engine on rails is now a legend, a reminder of how far railroads were willing to go to chase ultimate strength. Across all ten giants, one pattern stands out. Railway power was never about just size or fame. It was relentless experimentation, pushing limits until rails or budgets broke. The true story of locomotive strength is innovation doomed by its own ambition. These forgotten monsters prove that history remembers what survives, not what was strongest. Which one would you resurrect? Drop your pick in the comments.